Did Puma make two different shoes with the same name? One with a full carbon plate and one without? One version with all Nitro Elite foam and one with just some? One with an all-terrain outsole and one with just standard Puma grip? It's time to run in the Deviate Nitro 2 by Puma. Hey guys, welcome back to the Time to Run channel, where I do most of the research so you don't have to do it all on your own. My name is Joel. It's time to run in a brand new pair of shoes. Today I'm going to be going over the Puma Deviate Nitro 2. Not just one, but two pairs. Before I start this review, I just need to go over a couple of disclosures first. I purchased these shoes with my own money. These opinions and observations are my own. And no one gets to edit, preview, or provide feedback prior to me posting this video here. No one's paying me to review these shoes or make this video. I'm not sponsored by Puma or any of the brands seen in this video. Lastly, if you like any of these products seen in the video, I provided Amazon links in the description below. If you don't know what an Amazon affiliate link is, it's a convenient way for you to browse and purchase products I've listed in this video. And in turn, if you both use the link and make a purchase with said link, I receive a small percentage of that sale. And because using the link doesn't add any additional cost to you, you're essentially helping me out by the purchase you've made. So check those out below if you see any products you like in the video. And before I start the review, if you found this video helpful, please consider subscribing to the channel. It's super helpful and lets me know how much you appreciate the content I'm putting out by doing so. Now let's get to the review. Now right off the bat, I wanna cover the fit. And to do so, I wanna preface and set a backdrop with my initial experience running in and ultimately returning the regular width version of the shoe. These shoes did not feel true to size in my US men's size 12. The toe box was more narrow than what I'm used to in a size 12. I just about loosened the laces as far as I could at the midfoot to still make it suitable for me running in them. Admittedly, I do have a wider foot, but a shoe reminiscent of the Nitro 2 is the Saucony Endorphin Pro version 1, which is sitting right back behind me. And I have those shoes in a size 12, regular width, and I've never had an issue with those. So. Comparing the two, I feel like they should hypothetically fit about the same. Initially, when I figured out the fit was wrong, I immediately went onto Puma's website to check out if they sold the shoes in a wider width or even a half size up. I checked the website and believe it or not, for the lime color at least, 11 and a half is the last highest half size they offer. Everything else offered were whole sizes from size 12 up to 14. In the same page, there were no apparent offerings for wider width shoes for the DV8 Nitro 2. So admittedly, I found myself fairly frustrated. It seemed like it was a fairly big oversight on their part. But just to be safe, I decided to call into customer service and ask a live person for more clarification, which turned out to be super helpful. The person I spoke with pointed out on their website, Puma separated the regular width options from the wide width options. I don't really know why they did this, but that's how they separate the two. So if you wanted a wide width shoe, you need to track down and click on the DV8 Nitro 2 wide men's running shoe option, which shows a completely different version and set of colorways and options than the regular width shoes. Because of this, thankfully, I was able to return the lime color shoe I bought originally that didn't fit and purchase these in the wide width version. So just wanted to set that as a backdrop before I continue with the rest of the review. The upper is made of a extremely breathable mesh material, consistent matching the quality of other popular trainers. There's give in the material, it's flexible and just stretchy enough that you don't feel restricted in any way. The design up top have a siped look from front to back and a striated pattern as well. I really like this colorway, the orange to hot pink transition is a really eye-catching color. They're calling it Sunstream Sunset Glow. This, of course, is yet another example of a fair weather colorway. In winter season, this pair of shoes is going to probably look terrible. I have run in it, and this morning I actually did a run in the snow and ice, and it doesn't look like I did any of that. So that's a, that's a pretty good indicator of how the shoe is actually doing as well. So I want to mention that the interesting thing I found, at least here in the States, was that the colorway options are different in the wide versus the regular fits. And Puma also rolled out more colors since me purchasing this wide option. For example, as of when I bought the lime pair with a regular fit, 
there were no other colorways. There wasn't black, there wasn't this puma white sunset glow sun stream. And only recently in the last few days did this sun stream sunset glow option in the regular size become available to those wanting it in a regular fit. Even more strange, there still isn't a black colorway here for the regular fit, at least here in the States. It's only available in the wide fit. But I imagine by the time you're watching this video, they've already added one in the regular size option. I hope so, at least, because I feel like that's a pretty popular colorway. The Puma icon located in the front here is also pretty eye-catching. Now on the side, Puma is calling their welded overlays power tape, which is there to provide stability on the medial side and on the front lateral part of the shoe too. And it wouldn't be a pair of Puma shoes without their iconic Puma form strip. Not only is it essentially a logo without actually being the logo, the strip, which actually dates back to 1958, has served as a means of stability in their shoes as well. And the strip is no exception. Now with the tongue, you get a semi-gusseted style. It's thin, it's comfortably padded up top here, while the rest of the tongue gets out of the way, so you don't even have to think about it. You can cinch down the laces while getting the comfortability and lightness you're wanting. For a daily trainer, you don't get a stiff running experience like you do for many other daily trainers, or even as a racing shoe on a budget. Stepping into this pair of shoes, my experience could only be described as bouncy, light, and springy. The comfort from the midsole foam that Puma is calling Nitro Elite is super light, super comfortable, and very responsive from landing to toe off. So this pair of shoes I'm holding exclusively has a premium Nitro Elite foam. This is the wide shoe. And you may be thinking, wait a minute, I just watched a totally different review where the reviewer said that it has both Nitro and Nitro Elite foam. And they may have been correct if it's in this regular. According to the Puma website, the regular size shoe has part Nitro Elite as well as regular Nitro foam. Meanwhile, this pair does not. It has Nitro Elite foam, just the premium foam, at least according to the website. Who knows why this change occurred and why there was differences between these two options. Regardless of the difference, having run in both versions, I can attest they both feel very light and comfortable and bouncy. And that's where we get into the next surprise. It's what they're calling power plate. Visible from the outsole, as for this wide version I'm holding, you get a carbon composite plate made up of part carbon fiber and part TPU. Whereas the regular, according to the website, which is worth mentioning, they did not differentiate or list it being a composite, which leads me to believe that this is, in the regular shoe, a full carbon plate. I will say, it did seem that there may have been slightly more energy return from the regular versus the wide width fit shoe. Is it just in my head? I'm not entirely sure. But certainly, if this doesn't have a full carbon plate in this one, it could be the explanation as to why I felt the other one had a slightly more energy return. Also, it doesn't really matter that much to me because I don't really have a choice. The other one didn't fit as well. So continuing on, Puma is calling this a max cushion trainer. Now you may be thinking, well that sounds terrible to use a max cushion shoe as a daily trainer. And normally I would agree with you. But what it feels like is a very comfortable daily trainer that you could also double as a racing shoe. It's similar to and possibly more comfortable than the Saucony Endorphin Speed. They're similar enough in my experience, and the advantage here is that you're getting more carbon plate than graphite polymer that you do in the Saucony Endorphin Speed for the same price if you were to purchase their latest upgrade. While form factor and shape of the shoe does not scream your typical max cushion shoe compared to the Hoka's and the New Balance and Brooks of the same category, they tend to also be bulkier with more bulbous and outwardly expanding midsole foams. I can certainly attest to their comfort and claim to be a max cushion shoe. Now the dimensions are as follows. I couldn't find the measurements on Puma's website, so I took my own measurements and compared those to other trusted running websites. What I came up with was as follows. With 38 millimeters of stack height in the heel and 30 millimeters in the forefoot for an overall 8 millimeter drop. The measurement Puma did provide on their website was that of 6 millimeter drops. And if you did the math just now, everyone else's measurements are 2 millimeters off. What are you going to do? Now, compared to a trainer such as the 2021 Saucony Endorphin Speed, which was 35 millimeters in the heel and 27 millimeters in the forefoot, totaling also an 8 millimeter drop. It's the most comparable shoe to the Puma DBA Nitro 2, due to the same drop in millimeters. 
However, the DV8 Nitro 2 is of course three millimeters taller overall. This gives you a slightly more aggressive ride, but likely unnoticeable since the difference of three millimeters is, I don't know, minute at best. The drop really just speaks more of the overall cushioning of the shoe. And I see the shoe more as a daily trainer, whereas I do not see the Speed 2 designed for the same purposes of a daily trainer. People certainly used it in the past for that purpose, but I saw it more of a speed day and a race day shoe. Now continuing with more specs, my US men's size 12 weighed in at 10.65 ounces in a single shoe or 21.3 ounces as a pair. Now Puma seemed to be a little cagey, pun intended, with their details on the website about the wide size 9 and what it weighed. So I pulled the stats for the weight of their regular shoe size 9, which was also not listed on their website. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure why. From what I gathered from other sources, they're about 9 ounces, I think 9.2 ounces for the size 9. Now the lacing system and laces look pretty fun. It's almost like they're molded and modeled after the asphalt roads here with yellow lines and the stripes look like they're telling you to pass whatever's in front of you. The overlay doubles also as eyelets making these laces very secure right here. I will say the laces on the regular width size 12 took some getting used to. Initially I found the laces just at the top of the toe box to be a little too tight and restrictive from how Puma set them up originally when I got them out of the box. Once I loosened them up, enough to get them comfortable that I dealt with a heel collar not fitting securely in the rear portion of the shoe. I had to use the extra eyelets up here which fixed the problem but upon returning from my run I experienced some foot fatigue in the midfoot. And this is the original indicator that told me that I needed a wider size. This one specifically because after my first run the regular width size 12 even though to the shoe's credit I felt the landing was comfortable enough the lateral medial part of my feet were feeling fatigued, a little sore compared to the center line of my foot. Once I got the US men's size 12 in wide and took them out for a run, I experienced a much more all around comfortable ride. I had to make sure to cinch up the laces up here, but you know, basic things. Other than that, the pair of shoes was totally dialed in. This first run in the wide shoes was similar to my first run, where I did a five minute warm up and I did 13 sets of two minutes of tempo and two minutes off. It was very windy that day, averaging around 16 to 18 miles an hour for the winds, but overall the run went exactly as planned. These wider width shoes felt much better after the run than the regular width shoes. My only gripe that I have with these shoes is probably these heavy plastic laces, mostly because I use this stride foot pod here on the front that can get annoying when you hear that clicking from the plastic tapping on the foot pod here. Now for the heel, like I said for the regular width pair, there was some adjustments I needed to make to get the right fit and lockdown. After a few minutes, I was good to go and completed a four mile inaugural run with the regular width shoes. In both shoes, the heel collar is comfortable with just the right amount of padding all the way around. And on the heel end of the shoe, there is this reflective overlay that covers a large area to give more visibility in the rear. Overlays surround the entire ankle, which is made up of some kind of micro suede material. It feels pretty soft there. And that leads me to the outsole. This is where the next weird observation was that I made. Both the wide and the regular fit shoes have what they're calling Puma Grip. This is their outsole rubber. The regular width version on their website is listed as Puma Grip ATR Multi-Terrain Rubber, which they follow up with more durable rubber compound for harsh elements and terrain. Now compare that to the pair I'm holding in my hands. This also features Puma Grip, like I said, but without the follow-up of ATR Multi-Terrain Rubber. Instead, that's omitted, but it has its own clarifying statement of Durable Performance Rubber Compound designed for all surface traction. The crazy thing to me is that these outsoles look exactly the same. And I mean exactly. They have the same lug pattern, they have the same cutouts and valleys. Nothing seems to be different whatsoever. And I cannot provide an answer as to why they've clearly made such a distinction without also making corresponding visual changes. I mean, I really, really, really studied the outsole pattern on these shoes for like a whole 10 seconds, but I can't find any differences. They perform the same on the road. They're both equally durable. And even when I did a couple of walk tests, they handled even some ice spots with surprising ease. This morning run when I was running on the ice, there wasn't really any problem at all. And I'm really happy with the rubber. 
as it's pushed all the way out to the lateral part of the midsole where my foot strike wears away at the outsole the quickest. Certainly seems that this will withstand several hundred miles. But that's still yet to be seen, and of course my plan is to review these shoes again at 100 miles. And in light of the winter ahead, I'm definitely curious what those miles will look like. Let me explain that the following statement is one of the primary reasons why I'll, spoiler alert, be sticking with these shoes as far as the outsole is concerned. I care most about the durability and the versatility from the tread. And with many winter runs ahead, I was hesitant to buy a daily trainer that has either too smooth or even too thin of an outsole. For these shoes, that is not the case at all, which is great. I also don't really want to be too concerned when taking it over the occasional packed trail between two roads. In winter conditions, it means the tread will serve me better than other road shoes with smooth, non-textured outsoles, especially shoes that carry little to no outsole rubber protection. So where do these fit in my shoe rotation? The weightlessness of these shoes means they'll get you those daily miles without a struggle. Like I said before, these shoes would fit comfortably into the category of daily trainer, or due to the plate, they'd make an easy choice as a race day shoe as well. This shoe is reminiscent of the Endorphin Speed lineup, and many of you who ran and trained in that shoe use it as an all-around shoe as well. The plate gives you the versatility and springiness for those daily miles. Also, if you're someone who wants to only buy one pair of shoes for training and racing, I'd strongly recommend these shoes. Things I value in a daily trainer is first and foremost are the outsole that can handle many miles ahead, somewhere upwards of about 500 miles. If I get anything less than 300 miles, I'm pretty disappointed in the shoe. Speaking of which, I want to hear from you as to which shoe in the daily trainer category you'd like me to review next. Please leave the name of the shoe in the comment section down below. The shoe most mentioned in the comments, assuming it's in my price range, might get that next review. So that concludes my review of the Puma Deviate Nitro 2, both wide and regular fit. I hope you found this video helpful. Let me know by hitting the like button if you did. Also, please consider subscribing. Thanks so much for watching, and if anyone asks you what your favorite YouTube running channel is, just tell them it's time to run.